What up, what up, what up, what up? It's your boy, Peace Camp. Welcome to the best half hour of your entire Tuesday. You know what time it is, and it's time to get into his court. My squad would be T-Mac. Hola. Chili Will. Gracias, gracias, amigo. Let's do this. Over in Proverbs, I'm going to read two scriptures. Proverbs 11 and 1 says this in the Amplified, both in the Amplified. A false balance and a dishonest business practice are extremely offensive to the Lord, but an accurate scale is his delight. Over in chapter 20, verse 23, it says, Differing weights are detestable and offensive to the Lord, and fraudulent scales are not good. I said that because of it seems like that the chickens have come to roost in the NC2A, where all the years where they've been having this imbalanced scale, where it's all been to benefit them and to benefit their organization, you are now starting to see uh, student athletes now starting to say, you know what, I'm going to leave that organization alone and now go do what I want to do and benefit myself. Case in point, Milwaukee, and I'm rocking it right now. <laughs> Milwaukee has uh, a couple of players have made some major significant moves. Starting off with um, Michael Foster Jr., the seventh ranked player in the nation has decided not to go to college, but to go to the G League. And that in itself, and, and in the interview, when he, he said that I'm going to do this, he said in the interview, I'm going to the pros because I like the way they're developing players for the league. So he's going to the G League to be developed for the professional league because he saw that college ain't going to develop me the way the league is going to develop me. Right. And so now that um, the um, NBA has taking that ban off of college players having to do a one and done. Now they're going, my one and done is now going to be developed for the league I'm going into. Right. And so right. that was major for the seventh ranked player in the nation to go, I'm going to the G League. Yes. You know, yeah. you now you, you're familiar with the Foster family, aren't you, Tim? I mean, uh, 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 Will? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar with them. You know, and so... What do you think about this decision that he's made? Well, I'm super happy. When I heard it, I was super happy. I don't like the ideas of the universities making all this money off the young men and women and not compensating them. And you got all of these people who can't dribble, can't shoot, can't hit a baseball, making millions and millions of dollars off the backs of these young people. So I was happy to hear that. And I like, um, cause you know, I'm a, I'm a labor person. So I like that the, uh, that the NBA has put together somewhat of an apprenticeship program where a person can come and play in the G League and, and, for, and get time on the court with uh, people who've already done it or have already doing it and learn the craft in order to become a professional and go into the league. I think it's ideal. Uh, I, have no, I, I have no sympathy for the NCAA. They've made enough money over the years that they'll be fine. So I'm glad that the big time star athletes are starting to see the light and saying, you know what, I can go and get money for me and my family and still go to the NBA. Yeah. Tim, your 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 input on that, bro. Yeah, I I I agree. Um back in my college days, I wrote a paper, should NCAA athletes be paid? And I was advocating for it then. There was a guy by the doc name of Dr. Rich, Richard Lapchick out of Northeast University. He was the leading authority on it. And in his stats, he had a lot of the comparisons of the money that the students, particularly in football and basketball, which were predominantly African-American, going back to about 1980 onward um, or so. A lot of them were African-American and a lot of them didn't graduate. And so the whole notion of, hey, you're getting a free education for in exchange for your athletic prowess didn't necessarily hold true if they weren't able to, you know, get the degree and get the spoils that, you know, supposedly come with having a, a, a degree. 
That said, I think that many of them were athletic students as opposed to student athletes. And if they had their druthers, they would do what they love to do, which is play basketball and to get paid for it. So given the restrictions that the NCAA has with regards to if you are on a scholarship, you can't have a job, you know, you can't receive extra money from people. If you want to take your girlfriend out to a movie or so, you don't have any bread because you don't have any income coming in. And if somebody that you knew from back in the day, one of your road dogs, somebody from the church, a guy that maybe might have been a mentor to you or whatever, he couldn't necessarily hit your hand with any money because now you run the risk of being in violation of NCAA amateur rules. And so for this opportunity or portal for players to say, you know what, I'll take my talents straight to the NBA from my high school or prep school level. I think it's a great thing because what it is, it's like Will said, it's labor. If I am exchanging physicality for some compensation, I want to be able to have it and eliminate the middleman that has arbitrary rules that disproportionately benefited them and not me. And I think it finally is in line with other professional sports, the hockey, tennis, golf, where a soccer, where a child prodigy, somebody 14, Freddie Adu comes to mind, which was the phenom out of Washington, D.C., out of the DMV. Uh, the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, when he was 14, had an opportunity to play pro. Uh, Luka Doncic in the NBA was playing professional since he was like 16 or whatever over in Europe. So now this is an opportunity to say, well, hey, if you have the chops to go pro at a teenage age, go ahead and go for it because you get compensation and pay. The one thing I hope, though, with that development piece is that You know, we know that there's been a lot of promising players coming out of high school that were supposed to be phenom. Felipe Lopez comes to mind as one example that kind of fizzled out once they got to the pro ranks. Hopefully we can have more of a, you know, a sustained pipeline of young talent that gets developed and then they get a chance to really go to the NBA and have longevity in their careers as opposed to coming in right out of high school as a phenom but you flame out in the first year or two because now you're in the quote unquote real world and you got a job. So it's not just the love of the game anymore. There are expectations that come with people when they're giving you a paycheck to do what it is you do. Yeah. I, I, I love the fact that um, what it does is it's a win-win. Mm-hmm. It's a win for the league because the NBA are paying these kids on potential and it's better for me to give you, 500,000 or a million dollars in the G League to see what you're going to be and see if you can handle this level. That's a whole lot cheaper than giving you, signing you for three years at $6 million a year or whatever, $3 million a year, which is a rookie contract. Mm -hmm. And you don't ever see the court. You don't ever develop. And you never really get a chance to get your, your, your feet wet in really the NBA League. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's a win-win. And what I love about the G League is, let's say, for instance, you um, you, you you don't pan out to be a great and you're not ready for the NBA. You you can still have a good uh, a, a paycheck in the G League. You can right. still hoop and still get paid. It may drop from from a million down to maybe two hundred fifty thousand, but it's still good money. I don't care where you are. Right, you know, and like, you're doing what you love to do. Right. You know, so it really is a win win, you know, and so I love that. I also love what what has been what the pandemic and this whole Black Lives Matter has done. And what I love also to add what social media has done now as a top player, you don't have to go to one of these blue chippers to get into the league anymore because Internet, you can be seen anywhere. Case in point, um, our very own UWM, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, has got the fourth-ranked player in the nation to sign and go to their school. None other than Patrick Baldwin Jr. He has signed to come here to go to Milwaukee to play for his father. Big ups to dad. Right. Go Panthers. Right. Good call. Will Wade, you called this about two years ago when we were saying when he was rising in the national ranks, hey, where do you think he's going to go? He's going to be recruited by Duke, Kentucky, Kansas, all the big boys. You say, hey, man, 
he's gonna play for his father. He's staying right here at UWM. And we were like, wait, are you serious? The mid-major? I said, look, watch and see. He's gonna stay here with his dad. So ha hat tip to you, Will. You called it two years ago. Well, yeah. I, I had the, I had the fortune of being able to be in the midst of him and his family, his mother, his siblings, his father. And I just saw the love that they had being around each other mm -hmm. and how much they enjoyed each other. And I knew it was so genuine. I knew if they had an opportunity to keep that in place and he still fulfilled his dreams that they would take it. So that's really the indication that I saw them interacting together, um, you know, at the Fresh Coast and some other things uh, it gave me the intuition that he liked being with his family. They liked being with him. And I think they was going to try to keep it together if possible. So I'm so happy. I mean, I texted his dad and congratulated him and the whole family. And um, he texted me back and said that, you know, thanks so much. It meant a lot to him. And he appreciated all the support over the years. So I'm, I'm just happy for UWM. I can't wait to go to a sold out U.S. Cellular Arena and watch UWM put they put their foot in somebody's butt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's funny is uh, I was talking because, you know, my son-in-law coaches for his assistant coach with UWM basketball team. And I was asking him, I was saying, do you know what's going on? And he was saying, you know, coach has been keeping everything close to the chest because he even because he's trying to figure out I need to go get a new I need to get some twos for for next year. Only to find out you ain't you don't need no two because that's where he plays. Yeah. That's where that's where Baldwin plays. So now they're like, okay, well then we shouldn't be even trying to do that. Had we known this, we could have that could have been a chip for us to get other you know, higher rate players and some 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 big men to really put some help around him. But he said, you know, y'all heard. He said, I heard when y'all heard. Yeah. Said, he really kept that close. I'm like, your office is right next door to him and he ain't telling you nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. it's quite it was, it was a quite delicate situation. But and Tim, you and I spoke about this offline with the transfer protocol in place, mm -hmm. shopping for basketball players, proven basketball players who have collegiate stats. They have uh, people who can vouch for their attitude and their work ethic is a lot easier than trying to get some raw person from a high school or uh, a junior college who had to pay, played on this level before. So I think the transfer protocol will allow them to get what they need to put around him to have a very successful team. And they have some people coming back that are very talented, that's been in the system. I'm looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it. I hope they play Green Bay, Marquette, and uh, Madison this year. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, it was a, a major, major coup for them to, to, to get him as a graduate of UWM. I'm proud of my alma mater for pulling this thing <laughs> off. <laughs> so I'll get a chance to, 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 to roll to some of the games as well and talk a little trash if we can knock some folks off. And what it does also, I think, is helps us, if everybody can, you know, can stay healthy and live up to what we see as this great potential, is that it gives, you know, Wisconsin sports an opportunity to really put, you know, maybe three teams possibly into the NCAA tournament. I know yeah. back, you know, a few years ago when Nancy Zimfer was the chancellor, when we were going to the tournament regularly, I think Bruce Pearl was the coach at that time. She was making a comment about it really helped to bolster the reputation of the school because while you want to have solid academics, you know, great, you know, English program, chemistry program, engineering, what have you, sports don't underestimate how powerful of a draw that is for students to come to your school as well because you know you are athletically competitive and so when we were going to the tournament all the time we had a steady diet of you know increased enrollment and that kind of leveled off a bit and for it being the largest urban school that we have in the greater milwaukee area that really contributes a lot to our local economy this is going to have, you know, some reverberating waves sent out, you know, a ripple effect throughout the community. So it's really, really a great, great thing, a great exposure and coming off this pandemic with things opening back up. There will be a lot of excitement to be able to go to live events at close to, if not full capacity, to see this kind of competitive nature at its highest. So I'm really, really excited. Thankful for the school, thankful for him even being one that says, hey, family is important. It shows that he's not, you know, a young wayward kid, but understands great values and principles and hats off to his parents for even inst instilling that in him 
and right. bearing the fruit of those seeds sown even now in such a spectacular way. I'm excited as well. Well, can, let me just add this point. And what you just said, Tim, is very important and sometimes overstated and overlooked, especially in the Black community. Mm -hmm. The relationship that he has with his dad. All of us have sons mm -hmm. and we have relationships with our sons. And we know how important the nurturing and the sustainability of those relationships are and have been. For him to decide to go and play for his father, I think yeah. it says a lot about the relationship that he and his father has. Because you guys know, you guys know those relationships, sometimes tough love is, is rough. Sometimes yes, you have indeed. to put the hammer down. And sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, you have to have a whole lot of massage and, and lotion when, when the wounds come. So right. I think it says a lot about uh, a father and son relationship in the Black community. And I just wanted to thank um, Patrick Baldwin Sr. and Patrick Baldwin Jr for putting that on display in a city like Milwaukee because we need it. Yeah, you know, to add to that, this is what it looks like to me. From a guy, if I was on the outside looking in, you go, okay, you got Giannis for the Bucks in Milwaukee. Now you got a number fourth rank Baldwin in Milwaukee. Milwaukee is turning into a basketball mecca. What I love about this is the spotlight is back on because really Milwaukee really hasn't had a spotlight on its basketball players in a long time. We really haven't. You know, I think you and I were talking last week, Will, and I was asking how many players from Milwaukee have won a championship in the league. And so you said, you said, uh, 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 what's the kid's name from Washington? I mean, from King. Mike Wilkes. Mike Wilkes. But there were some other ones, you know, because I forgot um, uh, Freddie Brown won one. Yeah, and John and John Johnson from Mexico John High School, they won on that same Seattle team. Right. Freddie Brown, Johnny Johnson. But then you got a bunch of players who made it, champ who made it to the finals. You got Nick. You got uh, Tony Smith. You got... You got Spreewell, I think, has made it. Yeah, you know Ron, Butler, Ron Butler. Ron Butler. You know, he has a championship with Houston, doesn't he? I mean, with uh, uh, with uh, the Heat, doesn't he? I'm not sure. Or was he traded before by then? I'm not you know sure. No, no, he was because he was with the Clippers by then. Yeah. He was with the Clippers. And so you got some players who've made it to the finals. But what well, this Wait, wait, wait. Before we go on, I got to say my good friend and my good buddy, Terry Porter. Right, right, right. <laughs> Coach and player. Yeah. yeah. He made it to the finals. He didn't get it. He got Jordanized, but he, right. he didn't get it, but he made it. Let's just be honest. Who didn't get Jordanized at that time? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it ain't, no, it ain't nothing against him. No, just, no. Not if at you all. got Clyde and you got Mike, Mike's going to win. Yeah. You know? And so, but, but this, again, begins to spotlight what Milwaukee has to offer. And I hope it becomes a, a trend in Milwaukee's best players starting to stay here. I would love for our players to come and stay and not play for Marquette, not play for us, but play for UWM, the underdog school that really is in the city, that really is um, considered the, and I'm not trying to be funny, almost like the bastard stepchild of the schools in Wisconsin. I would love to see UWM, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, really begin to have a name, not just locally, but nationally as well. And I think this move can really put it on a national platform because it's been on ESPN, it's been all over Facebook. You know, both him and Foster have just been uh, blowing up Facebook for what they've done. And so I'm really excited about seeing what is going to happen and the trickle effect and, and of what could happen. And so, you know, even um, looking at the NBA, staying with the NBA, you know, last, last weekend we had the Hall of Fame and when, you know, the, just they inducted Kobe. And, you know, for me, it's emotional. Because, and who's bringing him in? Mike. And so it's real emotional. It makes you think, man, 
Kobe is really gone. This is like another awakening or, or another reality slap that Kobe's going into the Hall of Fame and his he ain't going. He won't be there for the for the for the uh ceremony. And 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 that to me is like you know, when he first died, when, when the first when the plane accident first happened, you know, I was kinda numb. I'm like, okay. But then you start to see players just kind of chime in and, and and then the reality started to kick in. And then when you had the interview with uh TNT with Shaq, um uh Kenny, Ernie, and uh, and, and Charles, Shaq's emotions really made you go, okay, this is this is true. And then the funeral took it to a whole nother level. And then everything kind of calmed down. And then Everything kind of calmed down. And then they did the All-Star, where, where now the winner gets the Kobe trophy of the All-Star, NBA All-Star. And now this. This is, I'm like, okay. we. Re I really, I, I'm not talking about anybody else. I really got to settle the fact that he is really gone. This icon, this tremendous athlete is really gone. And this was kind of a, the last, you know, scoop of dirt on the casket kind of for me. That, yeah, Kobe, he, he's really not here. You know, so. You, 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 know, you, you know what's interesting about that? I'm really not a Kobe Bryant fan personally. Yeah. I'm a Kobe Bryant basketball fan. I, Kobe I, Bryant, I I've never had the pleasure of meeting Kobe Bryant, but I've always um, uh, admired his performance in his office on that basketball court. Um, I could I couldn't watch the uh, the um, the um, funeral, Hall of Fame, the Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame induction. Uh, yeah, I couldn't watch it. Uh, I just emotionally I knew that I couldn't handle it, and that's strange for me because I'm never this emotional about somebody who I really I, I'm not close to, don't care about. You know, not that I dislike Kobe. I just I'm just I don't like Kobe like I like. Giannis, you know what I'm saying? Right. And Giannis thing is, is not basketball. It's the family, the man he is, how right. committed he is to the community and how loyal he is and how he carries himself. It's those type of things that endear me to uh, a lot of different athletes and, and people in general, you know. Right. But I don't have that with Kobe yet. I actually shed it tears. So I, I don't even understand how he impacted my emotions about you know him leaving, I could I couldn't watch the enshrinement because I just really didn't want to be in that space again because it was a bad space for me. Right. And, and then and then what I I got on my phone the last time that Kobe played in Milwaukee, I got videotape on my phone. I had some decent seats. I mm. videotaped it, some of the games, the free throws. You know, since he's passed, I've looked at that videotape like maybe six times. Something right. in me say, hey. Look at the video cable Kobe. And I just look at it. And I just look at him still alive and slapping five and hugging people. And Jason Kidd was the coach. And, you know, I just look at him on the free throw line. And it's right. just, I mean, Kobe impact on me personally as an individual. I can't even explain it. I don't even understand it that he had this type of impact on me because I really don't, I, I, you know, consciously, I don't feel that way about him. He, he, he impacted me unconsciously in a way that, I've never been impacted before. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I think Kobe, I mean, I echo all the things that you, you know, guys have said, but there was kind of maybe, I'll say, a, a threefold impact of the latest, I guess, 18 months, you know, from the time I got the news at the Cheesecake Factory eating out with my family that he had, had died in a helicopter crash to seeing all the tributes and the bubble and all this kind of stuff. And even now culminating in his, you know, I guess final chapter with the enshrinement into the hall of fame, it's kind of a threefold memory. Number one, to me, he was the second most, I'll say concerned guy behind Mike. So when I'm, I was a Mike fan, enjoyed the bulls and wanted them to win all the championships and all that. And I never, I didn't, I didn't root for the Lakers a whole lot when Kobe was on the team because I liked other teams in the Western Conference during his reign, such as the Denver Nuggets team when Carmelo was there and J.R. Smith was together with him, the the Sacramento Kings with Chris Webber, Pedro Stojakovic, and Mike Bibby. I wanted those teams to win, but when Kobe had the ball, 
I didn't like that because there was a good chance that he was going to bring home the win. I like, I like it <laughs> so I was Laker concerned fan. about you Kobe. Kobe. You know, you I, I ain't going to use fear because the Bible says he is not giving us the spirit of fear, but the power of love, <laughs> the power of the sound. So I ain't going to say fear. So I'll say he was the second most concerned person behind Mike. <laughs> if he got the ball, he about going to score, and then your team going to lose if you wasn't with his team. So that was yeah, Kobe. You know, yeah, Kobe. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that, that's that's number one. The concern number two was when I got a chance to go to the All Star uh, game uh, weekend in L.A. back in two thousand four. I didn't know the the love that Kobe had locally in L.A. and it crossed gender, transcended race. Everybody in L.A. loved Kobe, and we stayed with one of my wife's aunts there who lived in LA and you know she was a big Kobe fan too so he had almost like god-like status you know there and so all the love that he's gotten from players in this younger generation he was there Michael Jordan so I was kind of surprised by that but I appreciated the fact that hey people really dug his body of work I think the final thing that his death really has kind of brought home to me was the notion that life itself is a gift mm. it's the gift of life And really all we have is right now. Bible talks about now faith or choose ye this day. And there's something about the now, all of eternity, all of our experiences, they pass through the portal of now. So we have right now, the past is in the past and the future for some who have passed is not even guaranteed. So the nowness and the preciousness of the gift of life is really what has been driven home through all of this Kobe situation and his passing for me and says, you know what, I'm going to put off negative feelings. I'm not going to be getting in arguments with people. I'm not uh-uh. any negativity. I'm putting that fire out because all I have is now. And I want to make my now as positive and fruitful as it can possibly be, because this is all I got. And so those would probably be my threefold, you know, memories or impacts of Kobe, you know, his life and, and his and, and his passing. Yeah, fellas, great show. Hey, um, and I'm gonna close with this. You know, um, the great Marv Albert has said this is his last NBA season broadcaster. He is done, he is hanging it up. He is retiring after this season. And so that voice is something else that the NBA is going to miss. Because Marv Albert, I mean, just about every major highlight, you know, you hear Marv Albert's voice for the win. Right. Jordan with a spectacular move. Right. You know, and so Marv (laughs) is retiring. You know, big ups to Marv. Bless you. But uh, like you said, Pastor Tim, the Bible says our life is but a vapor. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I tell people when I talk to youth, I said, listen, if you look at somebody's tombstone, it says the day they were born, that dash, and then the day they die, they left here. What's most important is not when you were born or when you left. It's what you do with that dash. Yeah. So every day we have to carpo diem. We got to seize the day. So with that being said, listen, thank you again for tuning in. Have a great week. You are, you are now listening to, or you have been listening to, the number one faith-based sports talk show in the entire world, Into His Court. Until next week, same bad time, same bad channel, every Tuesday on Joy 1340 and 98.7 FM. Have a great week. Peace.